The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... It's all in somebody's eye and how they see things, and I will argue that uh, you don't have to be in a big city to be creative. This instrument in Appleton is the first organ that I ever built. And this is a, it's still very much a, a family brewery. One day we might be brewing beer, the next day we might be bottling, the next day we might be fixing something. It's never a dull moment. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Cinematographer and filmmaker Jared Aronson shares with us his artistic inspiration and shows clips from his projects. Growing up, I really loved getting my hand on a camera whenever I could, and I'd shoot uh, a bunch of videos on my parents' digital camera and explored editing and the whole filmmaking process. And then I went on to college uh, to, do cin to study filmmaking and cinematography because I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. So this first project is uh, an abstract project and uh, it was exciting for me to work on because it was completely my own and it was something that I shot over the course of two days and really immersed myself in the project. It, it kind of sounds weird but I felt like I really was like a part of the project when I made it. I would say the aesthetic is um, perhaps the tone, the, the kind of haunted, scary tone of the project. I think I was really trying to portray an emotion more than anything. But for me, it was taking each individual sound that I thought was scary or eerie and using those sounds together on top of layering different sounds and uh, really matched it very well to the shots that I had made. An abstract project can be anything, really. Uh, it's more of a project that really has no meaning, but has a meaning to the person maybe who creates it, or has uh, a lot of interpretation in it, just like any art, where there's not a static meaning to the project, but you get to kind of look at the project and say, oh, it means this to me. And if somebody else watched it, it means something different to them. So I think an abstract project is more of an art piece than an actual film. This project is called uh, A Day Without Fire. And I went and had a relative that I knew in Chicago that was um, the fire chief at a Chicago fire department, specifically one of the fire departments he was the chief at was Wrigley Field Fire Department. So it was a very unique uh, opportunity to kind of get into the heart of Chicago fire and not the TV show, but get in the heart of the real Chicago Fire and uh, follow this guy around and see what, what happens in the day of a Chicago Fire Chief. Three, 20 pitches in the first inning for Feldman. This project was shot all in, in one day. And uh, at the end of the day, there was 
uh, a singer who maybe had just left a bar or had performed at a bar but had stopped by the fire department and the firefighters just sat down and she played some music for them. And I thought it was a really great moment. And this day there happened to be no fire and when you think of a fire a Chicago firefighter you think of going to fight fires all the time well then there's these off days where they're not really fighting fires they are just going around on these random calls and so it's all about maybe the culture and uh, just the feel of the day in the, in the life of a Chicago firefighter. This project is called This Is My Town, and it was a project I did which showcased the town of Redwood Falls, which is my hometown. So working on this project was, uh, I was very close to it. I was very in, inside it because I would lived here, grown up here, so I know what it's like in this town. We make a great destination was very uh, planned in that how I transitioned and how I moved. This was fun to have control of this project and uh, create something that was very unique. We're a town where you can find the adventure you've been looking for. I worked with a couple other people on this project and I uh, was able to pick the venues based on what what we decided were the best and the most positive things that would showcase the town. And your hobbies don't have to be indoors. Of course, Redwood Falls, there's this waterfall, so I think I incorporated the waterfall in a couple shots and uh, really focused on the things that would put the town in a good light as best I can. I think Redwood Falls, where I live, is a great place to be an artist. And I think uh, people put their own limitations on themselves when it comes to creativity. And many people flock to where other creatives are in order to be creative but I see it as uh, I am always going to be me where I am and my creativity uh, is, is a reflection of what's around me and what my opinions are and has nothing to do with where I am. But creativity for me has always been personal and what is it that really uh, gets me going or sparks my creativity. It's all in somebody's eye and how they see things and I will argue that uh, you don't have to be in a big city to be creative. Do you use Facebook, Twitter, or other social media? Connect with us to get immediate access to behind the scenes videos, previews, and other postcards and pioneer news. We visit with pipe organ builder John Nordley about the first organ he built 37 years ago at the First United Methodist Church in Appleton. When, when I was very young, probably about 19, oh, I'm going to guess 58 or so, I was with my family, a member of First Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls. And at that time, they acquired a new pipe organ. They bought a new pipe organ. And I was six, seven years old. And my mother said, I came to her at Christmas, and I said, what I really wanted for Christmas was a pipe organ. And she said, no, you know, that's, she thought I just wanted a little instrument or toy or something. I said, no, I want that big one like they have in the church. And that's kind of how it got started. It was always in the back of my mind. Rolling on, I, you know, graduate from college. And I went out east to Boston. I interviewed with three different companies. I picked the company that I wanted to work for. They all offered me jobs. And I went to work for the Noack Organ Company in Georgetown, Massachusetts. And it was a delightful place to study. There were organ concerts going on every weekend. I did my apprenticeship. I was there for two years. And at the end of the, my two years, um, 
I came back to an ins to install an organ in 1976. It was March of 76, and it was at uh, Gustavus Adolphus. And as I rolled into the the school, you know, and and went into the commons, my name was being announced on the PA system, and I was supposed to pick up a certain phone. And I went to the phone, and who should be calling me but uh, a Reverend Richard Coleman. I met John at Gustavus Adolphus College, where he was doing some repair work on a small practice organ there. Our organ committee, which had been appointed by then, decided to interview this young man and see what he was like. We probably sat down, we sat down across the way here in the parish hall, and talked for a couple hours. And one of the last things he asked me was, well, so what, would, you know, what would you design for an organ for this church if you were doing it? And I sketched something on a, we always say napkin, but a piece of paper. And he said, well, the stop list? And I drew the stop list, what it would look like. I must say the committee interviewed at least uh, three different firms. The kicker was probably John's drawing of this instrument and how it would look in the situation. And I think that appealed very much to the committee. And he said, you know, he said, we're going to be signing a contract soon. He said, if you'd be interested in building that organ, he said, I think we would hire you to do it. Completely out of the blue. I had no idea that that was coming. And I was, wasn't quite prepared for it, really. John is a very meticulous craftsman. He's a very good businessman, too. He's a person who can be trusted, but he knows the physical craft of organ building and that did impress the committee. I remember he brought in the keyboard to show us, uh, that he had created, to show us uh, to the committee, and it was great uh, to see that kind of craftsmanship. So it's reliable craftsmanship over a long period of time. The basic priority is to support congregational singing, and in a small situation like this, hymn singing. The vitality of hymn, hymn singing is very important. The pipe organ is a wind instrument, and the committee wanted the genuine article, a pipe organ, if possible, in a small situation. Um, and it was possible because uh, farm prices were good then, and John's first uh, proposal uh, had a decent price attached to it. Well, actually, I got the check before I ever left Massachusetts, sent it to my mother, and told her, it said, set up a checking account with this money. And that's what she did. And I, she said, what, what name? I said, just call it J.F. Nordley Company. And uh, that's really how it got started, just that fast. Anyway, I moved back, started designing and building immediately. And in the, the spring of 77, we were ready to move this instrument into place. The condition of it today is just like the day it was put in. I can't tell any difference. It's tuned, it's wonderful, it's always more wonderful than I remember. It's a one manual pedal. Uh, it's small, but it has a wonderful small variety of sounds in it. The, the sounds make a big difference. They're very present to the room, and it helps you become a better musician when you practice on it. This instrument in Appleton is the first organ that I ever built. and. Um, it it's, means a lot to me that it still has such an incredible draw after 37 years. You know, it's history. Uh, you know, people love to come and hear it. I still love to come and hear it. What we did today was we came up to look at the instrument, to figure out, and it's spring now, so things are calming down. We found a few little ciphers where it was, you know, speaking just a little bit when it shouldn't and we adjusted those, and then we had to tune the instrument. This instrument's been very stable in the tuning. I think it probably, well, today we tuned three pipes in the organ out of, what, about 600 pipes, and there were only three that needed to be, real, really needed attention. We have a program coming up in Sioux Falls, and it's for, for young pianists who want to learn something about the pipe organ. And so I was talking to my brother Paul, and we came up with a method of making a pipe, 
like this little wood pipe that was completely cut on the computerized router. So we could cut about 20 of them at a time and out of one block of wood. We have and glue them together and, and make them very fast. So in a matter of a couple hours, he produced 70 of these little pipes. But the neat thing about them is that a student can look at this and um, they can learn a little bit about how a pipe is made. They can also blow on the whistle and they can practice some of the theory that goes you know, into pipe organ building. This is an open pipe. If it had a stopper on the end of the pipe, which you can do with your thumb, it's roughly an, uh, an octave lower in pitch. So this is without the stopper and with the stopper. The largest flue pipe in the Appleton organ is uh, eight feet long, but it's stopped, so it's actually playing a 16-foot pitch. So that's pretty low. That's about, I'm going to guess, about 32 vibrations per second. They're almost like, somebody once said to me, it's, it's kind of like your children, actually. And I say, it, it is. I kind of have, you know, a lot of them out there all over the place, these little pipe organs that are, you know, kind of like my children. You know, and kind of like children, sometimes, you know, you're really happy with them and sometimes, you know, they misbehave. But uh, this one's been a really good instrument. <laughs> it's, it's stayed in tune. It's worked well. You know, it's just been a, a great instrument to have in my, uh, my opus list, and this being opus one. Visit Pioneer.org for more information on postcards and other Pioneer productions. Pioneer On Demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience, including past episodes of postcards. Dustin Brow of Brow Brothers Brewing Company shows us around their new location in Marshall and talks about the rise of craft beer culture. My name is Dustin Brow. I am a head brewer and CEO here at Brow Brothers Brewing Company. On a day-to-day -day basis, um, I'm taking care of everything from administrative duties to um, fixing things to literally being the bottle washer at times. So uh, we all wear a lot of hats here, so and, and, and my position is no different. This is the mill. This is where we crack all of our barley in half and get it ready for the rest of the process. Roughly this batch today we're making is moo juice. It will take uh, right around 1,200 pounds of grain as a whole. Barley, oats, a uh, little bit of uh, milk sugar at the end process, but th this is the basic ingredients in beer. So this guy's a mash ton. It's actually a combination mash lauder ton. We do two processes in this tank. The first one, the first process is just steeping the grain with hot water. Uh, that's going to turn our starch into sugar. After it's been, uh, after that, that starch has been converted into sugar, we're literally going to wash it off of the grain. So we're going to separate solid from liquid. Inside here at the very top, there's a, a rotating sparge arm that is going to just wash uh, all the sugar off. There's a filter on the bottom. We send it into this tank right here just to take specific gravity readings, make sure the color's right, make sure the temperature is where we need it to be. Once it's good to go in this tank, then we can send it over to the next tank. Behind me, Ryan's at the, uh, at the boil kettle. Uh, pretty simple process in there. Depending on the beer, we'll boil it from an hour to two hours. Um, a lot happens chemically in the beer, but it's just a boil kettle. Um, we'll add hops. Uh, if a beer needs a spice or any other ingredient like that, for instance, we do a beer which takes uh, orange peel and coriander, gets added in the boil kettle. Uh, once it's done boiling, we're going to spin it really fast in there. That's called whirlpooling. That takes all of the solids and makes it into a, uh, a cone in the middle on the bottom. Then we're going to take the wort which is unfermented beer, um, through two heat exchangers. We'll inject it with pure oxygen, 
because when we boiled it, we lost all the oxygen in the, in the, in the wort. Uh, and then we're going to follow this hose right here to one of our fermenting vessels. This barrel, or this tank, holds about roughly a thousand gallons of finished beer, uh, or unfinished beer right now. Uh, this tank is glycol jacketed and insulated as well, so we're constantly pumping coolant around here because when beer ferments, it's going to create carbon dioxide, uh, alcohol, and also heat. And so if we don't cool it down, it's going to get really hot. This particular beer we're going to ferment at about 68 degrees. And if we were to not cool it down, it'd ferment at just under 100 degrees. So we're, we're, we're sending the beer into this tank right now in this hose, and uh, it'll take two batches to fill it up. But once all, once all is said and done, this will hold about 60 kegs worth of beer. From there, after fermentation is done, it's going to go across the brew house to a finishing tank like this. We call this a finishing tank, a bright tank. You'll hear them called government tanks, uh, conditioning tanks. So after the beer has been fermented out, it's going to go here to finish. It'll get carbonated. It'll get chilled down. You can see all the condensation on there. Um, and then it's ready to be either kegged or bottled or sent directly to the tap room. So we're going to follow the beer line to the bottling line, which is right at my feet. And this is our bottling line. Our packaging area in the building is about 7,000 square feet, but behind me is the filler. It's, uh, it's, this fills the bottles, it crowns the bottles, it'll send it on its way through a pasteurizer. Some of our beers are pasteurized. And then at the very end, we've got a, uh, a pressure sensitive labeler where the bottles get labeled and then hand packed and ready for shipment. And this is a, it's still very much a, a family brewery. I've got an older brother who helps us with logistics. Uh, my younger brother's our uh, head of IT, if you want to call him that. Um, and so everybody really fills apart. My sister-in-law works here. My dad uh, calls himself head of quality control. I don't know what that means. Mary, uh, my wife, is uh, uh, our general manager, basically. We uh, went to school for hotel restaurant. And one of the ways that we thought we could get people to, to uh, uh, come to our restaurant was to have beer, and this was in the mid 90s. And so it was, craft beer was still just really growing and it was really kind of on the ground floor in terms of the industry. Or we decided to kind of focus on the beer production a little bit, because we told ourselves that if we went into beer production as opposed to the restaurant side of it, we wouldn't have to work nights and weekends. Well, of course that didn't work out so well, but uh, we actually started as a brew pub in Lucan, which is about 200 people, about 20 minutes uh, east of here. When we established the brewery, I think the first or second summer, we planted a hop yard. We kind of put both feet in a little bit because we, we planted 11 different varieties of hops, uh, right around 1,200 hop plants. And um, I think today it's still the largest hop yard in the upper Midwest, at least in Minnesota. And so what we do with that is we'll pull all our hops down every fall and make a fresh hop beer out of it. And we call it 100 Yard Dash because at one time the hop yard was literally 100 yards from the, from the boil kettle. So it was, it was great because we could pull those hops down and literally, you know, if we wanted to, we could have them in the, uh, in the kettle uh, an hour after we harvested them, a half hour. It always depended on the variety. And so, uh, so we, we, we inadvertently made ourselves farmers. A, a really important ingredient in beer is hops, and, and it seems like it's getting more and more important because we're not just using them for bittering anymore. Originally, you used to use hops to, uh, to, to balance the sweetness, uh, the inherent sweetness in beer or, or from barley malt, and uh, so it was kind of the balancer. Nowadays, we use them for flavor. We use them for aroma. Um, they are... Um, a great uh, antibacterial agent, so they'll actually help the beer stay fresher or better longer. Um, so we use hops for quite a few things. Now, nowadays, the, the specialty hop market has changed so much that they're actually breeding varieties for specific flavors. I can tell you just from 99 when I started commercial brewing till now, the usage of hops is absolutely totally different. Today we're looking to make up for a lost year because last year was a moving year. We, we spent uh, all of uh, 2013 just getting the brewery packed up and moved and then setting it up again. 
Um, but I'd like to brew about 5,000 barrels this year, and uh, our system is capable of probably, with our newer fermenters, we can probably pump out maybe 10 to 12,000 barrels of beer a year. So that's roughly, you know, 20,000 keg equivalents. Um, uh, and uh, we'd like to be up to there somewhere in the next two or three years. Tap rooms are kind of a new animal for Minnesota, and so um, on our scale, tap rooms just became legal uh, a couple years ago. And so uh, originally, it's, it's funny because when we were looking to upgrade and to, to get a bigger building, we had no, originally we had no consideration for tap room because we couldn't. And so now, when you establish a brewery or, or plan a brewery, you have to take into consideration the fact that it can be a public place. You know, it used to be you would just put your brewery in the industrial part of town, and uh, it didn't really matter for the most part how it looked or how it how it uh, how it appeared to the public. Um, but now, we're actually designing them and locating them with that in mind, so that we can get people in here to see what we're doing. Part of the beauty of a small brewery is that you can feel connected to it. You can literally go into that brewery meet the people who make the beer, um, talk shop with them. If you're a home brewer, it's a great place to swap ideas. Um, and so there's now you can, you can really feel connected to the people that are making your beer, which, which um, especially in today's um, atmosphere or environment with people wanting to go local, it, it, it's just a really good fit for it. Brewing has been so good to us, not just myself, but you know our family and uh, the area and Lucan and now Marshall. Um, it's uh, we honestly feel really privileged to be doing something that is a little bit atypical out here, and um, it's 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 fun not only because you're working with beer, but also because we we joke about the fact that we have to do so many different things and wear so many hats. One day we might be brewing beer, the next day we might be bottling, the next day we might be fixing something. It's never a dull moment. Do you have an idea for the postcards team? Email us, postcards at pioneer.org. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.